Welcome back to the swamp. Tonight, we are jumping into volume four of small town horror stories. These subscribers sent in their creepiest experiences in their small towns. If you have a scary story from a small town or in the middle of nowhere or just a scary story in general and you want to hear it in a video, be sure to send it to the email that you can find in the description down below. Let's get into these truly creepy tales. I am from Saluda, South Carolina, a very old and rural country town, steeped in Indian history. My grandparents are descendants of sharecroppers. They have been on the land for over a century and a half. We used to go from the city to the country every summer, from Atlanta to South Carolina, and in the country, it was a very set schedule to wake up, eat, go outside, play, and come back at noon to get back out and play. No in and out. Dust come in, wash up, eat, pray, and go to sleep. My brother and I would run off into the field and play all day, skip rocks at lakes, shoot squirrels, and rabbit with BB guns. We would eat berries and all sorts of fun. Well, in one particular part of the pasture, there was three circles of trees and bushes that even the cows didn't go in. Our grandmother told us that it was the Indian graveyard and we were to stay out of it. It was off limits. Every summer, we went up to South Carolina. My brother and I got closer and closer to strange places like that. One day, we braved up and we could see the staves and hanging skulls and feathers of strange tombstones and crows. There were artifacts all around. It seemed like the more closer we got, the more eerie it became. We would hear sounds of drums beating, see apparitions of chiefs, like looking like they were doing something around a fire, and sometimes we would see a lone eagle or a hawk fly overhead, cawing as we would reach and enter the patch. Well, we told our grandmother about it, and she just told us to stay out of there. We would disturb the dead, and bad things would happen. Being a kid, I was hard-headed, and one day coming back from a pond fishing, I walked past the cemetery. I ran up to it, slowing down the closer I got, and could see all the same things. Feathers, Indian arrowheads, bones, etc. This time, I grabbed one of the arrowheads and ran back to the house. I got into my room to examine it, and my grandma yelled at me to get ready to eat lunch. I stashed the arrowhead under my mattress before I could go look at it and ate. After eating, my grandma was in the kitchen and said that I should stay out of the cemetery. I said I wasn't in it, and she said, yes, you were. I know you were. I got silent and thought, how does she know? You can't see the cemetery from the house, nor any vantage point. She hasn't been in my room because she's been in the kitchen since I came in. After I finished eating and was about to head out, she said, if you got anything from up there, you better take it back. I said, no ma'am, I don't, and hurried out the doors as I wanted to play more. How did she know what was going to happen later that evening? It's too super weird to me, I just don't know how to explain it. Later that night, I came in, washed up for dinner, and sat and ate. It was rather silent this night. I sensed an odd feeling. Me and my brother said prayers and were off to bed. As I drifted off to sleep, I could hear little noises and thought it must just be old mouse or scurries or something along that. As I was dozing and my eyes got heavy, I saw my grandma coming down the hall, but as she got closer, it wasn't her. This person had the face of a wolf or a demon with stringy clothes on and walked straight into the room and got on my bed. I tried to scream, but could not. I tried to call for my brother who was on the top bunk, but my mouth was covered by the thing. 
It was laughing and slobbing in my mouth, over the top of me. I thought it was going to die. I was scared shitless. I passed out because it just choked me to sleep. The next morning I woke up to my brother saying it's time to eat. Come on. He hopped on down and ran for the bathroom, thinking I was going to chase him for who's first like every other morning. But I was still in shock. When I finally got to the table, my grandma asked how the both of us slept, and my brother said that he had an awful dream that something had broken to us. Not a person, but just something that he couldn't remember. As I went to blurt out my dream, my grandma said, Hush, like yesterday, at lunch, I told you to stay out of the cemetery. She said whatever you took from there, you need to return it. Nobody can take it back but yourself. I was deep in the bush of Canberra, staying away for a few nights with my soccer team. We were staying in a cabin about 50 minutes away from the nearest civilization. The cabin is in a valley surrounded by tall hills and mountains. There is plenty of wildlife around during the day. You see kangaroos, wombats, and emus all wandering the bush and valley. It's filled with life. One night, me and my friends were bored, so we decided to go on a late night walk through the valley. It was about 9.30 to 10, and pitch black. We had our phone lights, and that was about it. We've grown up in New South Wales bush, and feel very comfortable out here, as if it were our home. There's about eight of us, and we've been walking through the valley making jokes and having a good time. And we're about two kilometers away from the cabin now and we start walking a trail that goes from the valley to the top of one of the mountains. The trail went on for about another two to three kilometers, and once we reached the end, it brought us straight up to the tip of the ridge. You could see almost 360 degree view of the entire valley below, and continuous spans of bush, land, and mountain ranges behind us. At the end of the mountain was a ginormous boulder, bigger than any two-story house you can think of, and it was a strange shape. It overhung the edge of the mountain and had a cave system through the middle of it that went down under the ground level and to who knows where. We didn't want to go inside and find out. At the front of the rock, there was a sign claiming that this land is a spiritual land and is still roamed today by the spirits of the land. Me and my friends seen the sign and took it as bullshit and made jokes about it and started throwing rocks we decided it was time to start walking back to the cabin, as we were walking away from this massive boulder on the edge of this cliff, and we were about 50 meters away, then I got this sudden overwhelming feeling of being watched. Everything in my mind is telling me to run, but I don't know what from. As I turned around and looked back behind me, what I seen gave me night terrors for two years. There was this thing. It looked like a man, but was very slender, and its arms were so long its hands hung below its knees. It stood at least 8 to 10 feet tall. It was standing next to a gum tree we had passed just a few minutes before, and its head was as tall as one of the branches it was standing and staring straight at us. I was the first one to see it, and I froze out of fear. My friends realized I had stopped walking and were looking back at me and noticed. They all saw it as well. It bent down and picked up a log that would have been easily three to four meters long and thick as a telegraph pole, and picked it up and handed it. As soon as we saw this, one of my friends screamed, what the hell? We all took off running, straight down the side of the mountain, tripping over and rolling down things. We all booked it to the bottom and met up there. My older brother was due to come the day after, and when he arrived, we told him all about it. Luckily, we all made it back to the cabin, and we didn't leave until sun came up. When my brother got there, he said he didn't see anything, but he said that he felt a very overwhelming energy up there, like there was something watching him the whole time. He said he got a bad vibe up there and didn't want to hang out around for too long. 
Other than that, that's probably the creepiest thing we experienced that trip. I'll never forget that night, and I was hoping, if anyone has had a similar experience, I'd love to hear it. I would like to start by saying, whether you believe in demons or not, I can say that I know they are real and they do exist. What I'm about to share with you are real events that are not fictional. This is why I mention no names including the demon's name. I get chills just recounting these encounters. To preface, I am a 45 year old gay male who lives in a small town in the United States. My demonic encounter started when I moved into my first apartment in the summer of 1992. I was 20 at the time. Unfortunately, my demonic encounter lasted for nearly 8 years before I could finally get rid of it for good. I will only cover a few of the most terrifying occurrences that happened over that 8 year period. Now, on to my story. I have moved to Casper, Wyoming, a town about 55 miles from where I graduated high school. A friend of mine turned me on to a cute two bedroom apartment on Elm Street. Yes, I say Elm Street, folks. The apartment was the basement floor of a two story house that has been converted into two apartments. My friend had recently moved into the main floor apartment and I suggested my then boyfriend at the time and I take the bottom unit. It is an ideal situation since we all worked at the same mall at the time. It was mid June and there was no air conditioning in the apartment at the time, so you can well imagine it was pretty flipping hot in that apartment. I was in the middle of painting the master bedroom when I decided to take a break from the fumes and heat and headed to the kitchen to get a tall glass of iced tea and have a quick smoke. Now, keep in mind, I was the only one in the apartment at the time, as my boyfriend was working. If I recall, it was around 11pm, and he was not home to work after about 1am uh, usually. After finishing my smoke, I headed back to the bedroom to finish painting. As I walked back into the room, I realized there was something painted on the opposite wall of where I had been painting. There was no paint spilled on the carpet and the brush I had been using was right where I left it. My heart still pounding. I crept up to the wall slowly. The paint was still wet and slowly dripping down the wall. I gasped in horror as I read what was painted on the wall. It simply read, I am here. I bolted the hell out of there and waited inside on the stoop until my boyfriend came home. I was not about to go back to that apartment again by myself. My boyfriend being the skeptic dismissed it as maybe I had done it myself without remembering, or that the upstairs neighbor had snuck in and painted it, even though they were not home at the time of the occurrence. Fast forward a few months. We had been gone all day and it was late when we got home. Have an early day, the next day, I headed for the shower while he grabbed himself a beer. As I was showering, I heard the door to the bathroom open and close. I remember smiling to myself thinking he was going to join me for a shower and some playtime. I was in the middle of rinsing the conditioner out of my hair when I heard the shower curtain slide open. Decided you wanted to come for a quickie before bed, huh? I asked still rinsing my hair. Sounds good to me, a voice said that was not my boyfriend's. The voice sounded gravelly and low. About that time, I felt ice hands grab my shoulders from behind. I spun around only to discover I was in the shower alone. I exited the bathroom in such haste I did not even bother to grab a towel. Heart pounding and dripping wet, I was now in front of the room, panting and trying to catch my breath. My boyfriend shaking, uncontrollable and pointing to the bathroom. His eyes were fixed on what appeared to be a state of shock. His voice quivering, he whispered, I, 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 I saw it go in there. Fast forward two years. We had just moved into another basement apartment. This one was on the other side of town. It too was a house that had been transformed into separate units. The owner of this house and his boyfriend lived upstairs. They were offering killer deals for rent, so we had to jump on it. I think we were only paying, 
$200 a month for the two-bedroom apartment. We had only lived there about two months before the demonic activity started up again. There were old-fashioned swinging doors like you would find in those old western movies that separated the front room and the kitchen. We had moved in the new place about two months ago and there was no supernatural activity of any kind. We were thinking, maybe the entity had not followed us to our new home and had begun to truly relax. We were dead wrong. My boyfriend and I had just finished doing some things and we were getting ready to settle down to sleep when the saloon doors between the kitchen and the living room began to swing back and forth with a vengeance. The night lights in the kitchen and our bedroom went out leaving us completely in the dark. Come play with me. A demonic voice called out to my boyfriend from the kitchen. It was so loud it echoed through the entire apartment. Still shrouded in complete darkness, he both shook there uncontrollably under the covers. We began to quietly argue over who was going to break for the light switch located on the wall by the door. Not knowing what else to do, I yelled for it to leave in Jesus' name. The entity roared so loudly I swear you could feel the house shake. We could hear the saloon doors fly open. The night lights came back on, and we were alone again. For how long, we didn't know. It took us about 20 minutes before we could muster up enough courage to move. Needless to say, we did not get any sleep that night, and had every light in the place on. Fast forward another couple of weeks, our company for the evening had just left and my boyfriend and I had settled into our recliners in front of the room to watch a movie and chill for the remainder of the evening. A loud knock on the front door signaling one of our friends had probably forgotten their car keys or something caused my boyfriend to pause the movie and head to the door. He stopped short and shot me a concerned look. Puzzled, I asked him if he was going to get the door or not. He pointed out the most essential light was not on. Opening the door, he visibly shivered as there was nobody there and no vehicles in the drive but our own. As he shut the door, there came a loud crash and the sound of glass breaking from the kitchen. Walking into the kitchen, it took me a minute to figure out what had happened. The coffee pot was tucked into the corner by the sink and was now laying in a zillion pieces under the dining room table. The knocking started up again on the front door. Again, no light to indicate somebody was actually there. The knocking switched to the back door. Actually, it was more like pounding. The pounding was hard and loud, and I was sure the door was going to cave in. The air became thick and heavy so much it was hard to breathe. That was enough for us that night. My boyfriend and I bolted out of the house and spent the remainder of the night at a local Denny's restaurant drinking coffee, too terrified to return to that house until the morning. Now, fast forward another couple of years. By this time we had found a beautiful two-story home to rent. We loved it, because there was a spiral staircase between the two floors. The front door led you to the main floor of the home where the kitchen, dining room, and living room were. The back door leads you into the basement where the bedrooms and bathroom were located. It was a way cute little house and we loved it. That is until the entity found us again. I say this because after each move it seemed that it took a while for the entity to find us or show up anyway. I would usually dream that I was standing in a large room with doors all around it. In the dream, all the doors would all start slamming at the same time, as I ran from door to door trying to escape. As the last one would slam shut, I would try to leave the room, but it would fill with demonic laughter, which is how I knew it had found us once again. The night after having this dream, my husband and I were downstairs in our bedroom, putting our laundry away when we heard my mother hollering down to us from the top of the stairs for us to come up and visit with her. We shot one another a confused look because my mother lived about 55 miles away and never came out without calling first. That and both the front and back doors were locked. Thinking maybe my mom had made a copy of our house key and of course not wanting to be rude, I headed upstairs to visit with my husband hot on my heels. As I approached the top of the stairs, I could see the front door was still locked and there was no sign of my mom anywhere. The temperature in the living room had dropped drastically, causing me to shiver. 
As I moved into the living room, my boyfriend walked to the front door, opened it, and confirmed that there was no car in the driveway. That is when we both saw a large, black mass make its way slowly across from the wall from the kitchen into the dining room. Its slow movement appeared to be deliberate, as if it wanted us to see it. As it moved through the dining room into the front, my mother's picture flew off the wall past me and straight into the basement. As the years progressed, so did the entity's activities. It had gotten so bad that even our friends and family refused to come over. They would see the black mass, witness things moving on their own, and heard disembodied voices calling their names. One morning, I had just arrived home from a 13-hour night shift and had settled down on the couch to watch some television before heading to bed. Out of nowhere, there was a huge boom. It sounded like a bomb had gone off. The whole house, and I do mean the whole house, began to shake violently. It only lasted about 10 seconds or so. I am not sure because it felt much longer than that. I quickly ran outdoors thinking maybe a gas main in the chamber blew up or something. All was calm and still, and no one else seemed to be aware of that major boom that had just happened. As I was on the phone to the police department reporting what had just happened, my boyfriend and my brother who had stayed the night in our guest room came tearing upstairs in a panic. Their faces were pale and white, and you could see that they were truly terrified. The police assured me that nobody else had reported anything like that, and maybe it was just my house settling. My brother said the house shook so violently, it shook him right out of bed on into the floor. I knew then that it was a demon, and that this time, we needed to rid ourselves of it once and for all. I had several ministers, priests, and mediums come to my house. The mediums were at least more helpful than the religious men were, because they were too afraid to do anything at all, really, besides simply praying and leaving. I finally found a minister who specialized in deliverance ministry. She was well-versed in dealing with demonic activity and getting rid of it. She was able to ascertain the demon's name, which gave her power over it, or Jesus, or whatever. She told me it was not her exercising the demon, but rather the power of the blood of Jesus. I also learned the demon was not actually attached to me, but rather my boyfriend. I learned the reason it always took the demon a while to show back up was that the cleansing rituals I had been doing were working to a point, but that my boyfriend was the one that kept opening up the door, or so to speak, for it to return. I was not aware of it at the time, but he had not only been dabbling in witchcraft, but he was meeting with strangers in the graveyard for sex, since the cops heavily patrolled the city parks. They were once a hot spot for random hookups and drug use. Needless to say, I was able to finally rid myself of the demon and my boyfriend. Unfortunately, for him, the demon followed him and his life quickly fell apart. He got into drugs, alcohol, and worse. He passed away last year expectantly. We remained friends over the years and would talk on the phone or text. I spoke to him a week before his death and he had told me he was still being tormented by the demon. I have no idea what actually happened to my ex. It's all been kind of kept hush-hush, and I just pray he is at peace now. I suppose the best way for me to let you in on what happened to me and my best friend at the time, all those years ago, is to begin by telling you that I had no idea what we were looking at in those woods. There was no precedence in my mind for the shape that presented itself in front of us. No preconceived notions of what should be and what shouldn't. Due to this fact, my story won't contain any stereotypical rants of bumps in the night or scary ghouls with black capes and aristocratic Slavic accents. Only the truth will remain when I'm finished conveying what transpired that night. About 20 years ago, my life was fairly aimless. I was a year or so removed from high school, and I was working at my family's business with the aim to eventually take it over. Most of my friends had left our small town for college, and the greener pastures it contained. So, I along with one of the few remaining friends that I had left to socialize with, whom I'll refer to as Jeff, 
would frequently spend our time enjoying some of the outdoor activities that our surroundings presented. Some days we fished, others we would swim or boat ride. When in season, we would hunt game like white-tailed deer or the recently reintroduced elk species. The day that I refer to in this account saw us in his jeep enjoying some off-roading and logging trails that snaked their way through the surrounding mountains. It was about 9.30 in the evening and the sun had just made its way beneath the horizon by the time we had made it all the way to the trails. Most of the paths we took were wide, flat, paved with gravel and bits of sandstone and coal that fell off the big dump trucks as they were passing through the business haulings. The trail we had wandered onto was one that neither of us had ever encountered. It meandered its way around the back side of the mountain and had became little more than a dirt path that was only slightly wider than the vehicle. Tree branches stretched out like the twisted, leprous arms of some forgotten beast of the wild, forgotten by time. This aside, we were enjoying ourselves and didn't pay these ominous signs any heed. About an hour had passed before we realized that we were all off the main trail and needed to turn around to keep ourselves from not being able to get out. Jeff spotted a trail up ahead of us that went out to the left and emptied into a large field of high weeds ringed by maples and oaks. This would be where we turned around and also where our perception of what was real in this world got stood on its head. As he slowed the jeep down and made the turn, the headlights swept over the tops of the weed shafts and settled onto a large, black silhouette. Jeff slammed his foot onto the brake pedal and sat motionless in his seat, as did I. We both stared out the windshield at a spot in front of the jeep where the lights settled, but our brains weren't making sense of what our visions were feeding. Standing. At a height of what I estimated to be around 8 to 10 feet tall and about 4 to 5 feet in width was something that I hadn't seen up until that point in my life and have not witnessed again. Where the light should have bounced off to different angles and shapes of the body in front of us, it seemed to soak into the shape. The black that made up the only discernible difference from the landscape around it was such an absorbance an absence of any light, that it honestly looked as if it were drinking in the light from the lamps of the jeep. Instead of the shape being illuminated, we were able to tell the shape only by looking at the trees and grasses surrounding it. It was, with risk of sounding foolish, in the shape of a large man with a broad-rimmed hat and some kind of overcoat. The big hat shape that sat on top of the shape in front of us sat on it what could only be called like a slender neck that draped into the shoulders and down into the arms that kind of disappeared into a borderless absence. There were no legs to speak of, nor were there any facial features. As the light acted as if it were afraid of this creature and ran away from it instead of aiding us to be able to see what loomed before us. Do you see what I see? I managed to ask Jeff in a horribly shaken voice. He didn't reply, but instead threw the shifter into reverse and slammed the gas pedal against the floorboard. The back tires slung rock and dust alike into the air as we raced backwards away from this dark anomaly. The cloud enveloped the vehicle from behind and to the sides and blocked the creature from our sight. Normal thought processes ceased to exist the next few seconds when we tried in vain to grapple with what we had just witnessed. We only stopped racing backwards when his truck slammed into a small dogwood tree on the other side of the trail. This seemed to shake the fog from our brains, as Jeff then put the gear shift into first and sped back down the little trail with me screaming a string of curse words that I didn't even know <laughs> existed. As the tires finally met the asphalt, after what seemed to be hours on end of us careening down a mountain trail, near miss after near miss with escape being the only concept that filled our thoughts, we looked at each other for the first time since seeing the hat man as we called it. Neither of us spoke, as we knew what the other was thinking from expression alone. 
He dropped me off at the house, and I stepped out of his vehicle not knowing what to say. I turned to look at him, and we both simply nodded to each other. Sadly, we never got the chance to talk about him again. This must have bothered Jeff on a disastrous level, because only a few days after I got home, I got a call from his sister saying that he had overdosed and died. Only over the past couple of years have I heard accounts of the so-called Hatman or Watchers. Back then, I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at or what to call it. I did know it was there, however. I don't know if we just happened across something we weren't supposed to see or what the case may have been, but I have carried that night with me these past 20 or so odd years, this being the first time I've tried to put it all down on paper. I guess the moral would be, well, how? I don't know what it would be. Just be careful out there. Hi, my name is Fallon. I live in a small farming town in western Nebraska. What I'm about to tell you happened July 4th of 2006, at roughly midnight. I was 23 at the time and I'm also a female. I was coming back from trying to find my little sister from her summer job. I was traveling south on an old back road. Mind you, on both sides of me were cornfields. When my headlights shined on a pair of glowing yellow eyes on the side of the road and another dark figure on the south brown lane. At first I thought, okay, maybe some coyotes or something coming from the river. But when I looked closer, what I saw made my heart freeze and all I could do was stare. On the side of the road, there was a freaking hyena, a hyena. What the hell is going on here? But what was even freakier was its face. It had the face of a man as if it was still shifting or something. I slowed down, for I was coming up to my turn on the road that I needed to use to get to the city. But the turn could be a little tricky. As I passed, I made eye contact with what this, whatever this thing was. It was still shifting. I went straight home after that. I was too freaked out to, to keep looking any further. But it doesn't stop there. From July, to the end of August, I never wanted to be out after 9pm, but with the job I had at the time, it couldn't be helped. I would get off at 11pm or 1am, then I would have to take my sister home as well, after I found her of course. When I would drive through parts of town that was more dis open fields than anything, I would hear three voices calling my name, two men and one woman. They would giggle and run in the shadows laughing and calling my name. Also, when I was at work, I would have two guys always go through my line. They both were from South Africa, and they both were here for some kind of working job or something. At first, I didn't think much of it, until one night one of the guys gave me a weird and creepy smile. I just smiled back for in retail, one has to be nice. That night I went up to my car, and I found it unlocked and open. It looked like someone had gone through it. I was a little freaked out, but like how it all began, it all ended. But to this day, I still hold fear that they will return and finish what they started. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit a thumbs up, it helps me out a lot. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications as I upload videos almost every single day, sharing creepy stories and explaining all things creepy online. You don't want to miss another video. If you have a story you'd like to hear in a future video, be sure to send it to the email that you can find in the description down below. Also, I have some new shirts out, so if you don't see them below the video, you can go to the description and click the link and possibly check out and buy some shirts, I'd very much appreciate it. Also, come join me on Twitter and Facebook. I know YouTube isn't always the best at sending out notifications, but if you follow me there, you'll never miss a video.
as I always post them there the moment they go live. See you guys soon for another creepy video.